when you're positioning yourself in the market, um, you can, there, there's really only three ways you can optimize your business. You can optimize based on um, price, uh, based on quality or based on convenience. Mm -hmm. So when you're a solo entrepreneur, you don't want to be the cheapest. You're not working at volume. You can't, that's yeah. not going to work. Yep. Um, you don't want to be the most convenient because that means you're going to be on call all the time. And I mm -hmm. don't think you actually want that. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at quality and you don't need to be the most deluxe luxury, but like, we're going to celebrate your quality and we're going to price you at a quality price right? You kind of want to put something out there and it might need to take time to germinate. Like, like you're planting a seed, right? Yeah. Like I just planted tulips. I'm not going to see them come up until the spring. Yeah. Um, and that's how a lot of marketing efforts work. So even with these race force activities, you know, we might need to move on from it to see if it actually generated a result. Yeah. Um, and if we feel like it was wildly unsuccessful, great, let's move on from it. Like even more reason to shift gears and say, you know, I, I put in a solid three months at this project. Um, let's move on to something else. If in hindsight, right, like a year down the line, we're like, that was actually really effective. It just took yeah. like six months for them all to come up. Great, then we can do that again. Like you can yeah. always pick up the project again. My dinner table as a child was uh, my mom, my dad, me and my sister. Um, and usually it was my mom who cooked and, um, you know, we, she'd serve some meal and we'd have some chat. Um, and yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. traditional, ridiculously classic American, but yeah, yeah, that sort of a thing. Pretty cool. And was that, was that in Washington as well? Or did you? No, that was in, I, most of my childhood was in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and what, what did your parents do? Um, my dad was an astrophysics professor and oh, wow. my mom had, uh, worked for the executive MBA program. Okay. At okay. University. Yeah. Very cool. So were you, I, I mean, well, I know we'll get into, you know, how you got into the, the entrepreneurial side of things, but did you have any type of entrepreneurial tendencies or anything growing up at all? Or were you exposed to entrepreneurialism at all growing up? Yeah. So my mom owned a computer store when I was born and okay. then when I was in uh, elementary school ish, she was getting her MBA and then she worked with this MBA program. So um, she imparted a lot of like business wisdom. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid, we had a swimming pool in our backyard and my birthday is in November. So like I never got to have a pool party. So I was like, mom, I want to have a pool party. And she'd be like, okay, fine. Okay. I'm going to give you a hundred dollar budget, but you got to tell me how you're going to spend it. Uh -huh. And you can throw a pool party. And so I would like itemize out a list, like here's everything I'm going to do cool. and here's how I'm going to make it work. And, and I was so frugal that, you know, I would spend like half of that budget on pool toys because yeah. I could make, you know, the, the party favors and the, the food and the snacks and drinks um, for so cheap. Um, so yeah, so she was doing stuff like that my whole childhood where, where I was learning a bunch of these skills that that now I use all the time that are yeah. just, you know, that was part of my household culture. That's cool. That's cool. I've never, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone doing that before, but that, that makes perfect sense. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, so fast forward a few years, you, did you go to college? Did you do that whole thing? What, what oh, was yeah. that? What were those years like? Um, I went to college in Syracuse, New York at Syracuse university. And, mm -hmm. um, that was awesome. I went for a degree in architecture and then transferred uh, and ended up with a degree in geography, okay. um, you know, which relates to nothing. Love it. Yeah, I, was, uh, <laughs> I just was going to say, what, did you have any plans to use that degree with anything? Like, was there any, was there, was there a, a target that you're looking for? No, so the target was get out of architecture school. So okay. I was <laughs> Got it. three years into a five-year program and, uh, you know, it was like, okay, well, my funding's going to run out in one year all of a sudden. And mm -hmm. I have, you know, massive amounts of credits in architecture that don't transfer to any other degree. So what can I get a degree in that I'm somewhat interested in? Yeah. Um, and geography was actually a great place for me because um, I came at it from more of the social science side than the, the physical sciences. So it was a lot of like study of where people are and borders and, um, you know, social dynamics over space. Uh, and I really loved it. Um, and I think there's a piece of that that does work with my uh, my work today in a really sort of distanced way uh, where it's, you know, it's about how do I find my clients and where are they in the world? And that's, mm -hmm. that's a geographic question. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So, so you you graduated with the degree in geography. What was what was your next step? Where'd you go next? Uh, I moved out to the Seattle area. Okay. Yeah, I moved out here to Washington. Um, got a job, uh, an AmeriCorps job with Habitat for Humanity, which mm -hmm. that was actually the most beautiful blending of geography and architecture. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the housing problems um, in East King County, where I was working, had to do with geography. It was that the affordable housing was far away from the the, the jobs that people had. Mm -hmm. um, and I was building houses, so it was sort of like this fun meld. Yeah. Um, yeah, and after that, I, you know, I worked in nonprofit for a while. Um, I got into marketing and operations and uh, uh, and eventually started on this quest to like live my purpose, mm -hmm. uh, which brought me here. Yeah. And and what what was the catalyst for you to, you know, find your purpose, right? What were you like dissatisfied with what you were doing or what 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 kind of started leading you down that path? Yeah, yeah. Um so I had really wonderful, meaningful work. Um, and then the, the organization I was with was going through some major shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't going in a direction that like aligned with the growth I wanted to do. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to like go and conquer the world and do like, I'm going to go try the corporate thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've been working in nonprofits for so long. And I was like, I'm tired of the limited resources of nonprofit. I'm going to go work in corporate. Um, and that sort of, so that, that started it. Um, and then it was, you know, sort of an ongoing evolution of like, what is, okay, just conquering corporate is actually very big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what do I actually want to do? And what, what unique contribution do I have to make to society? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and is that what led you then to ultimately end up finding your, your current position? Or did you, did you kind of, you know, did you start anything else on your own, you know, prior to, to starting your company? Um, well, I had started a, um, a, a, a annual dance event business mm -hmm. before I started my actual business, my, my now business. Um, so I had some practice launching a business. Um, it was mostly a labor of love. It wasn't um, like wildly profitable, mm -hmm. uh, but it did, you know, it was a different format of all the same stuff that I, that I now do. Um, yeah, so, so yes, and um, a lot of it was sort of my trajectory went larger. So mm -hmm. like the last job I had before I became a self-employment coach, I was a, um, a management consultant. And uh, so I was working for like mid-sized company, like 500-ish employees mm -hmm. um, as a consultant. And, you know, I'd, I'd offer like the, the great ideas and insights that like I, I was trying to utilize and put into the world. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll run it up at the chain of command. We'll review it at the next meeting. We might start enacting this in six months. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, what, <laughs> what are you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was really frustrated that like, like I was finally getting to utilize sort of the insights that I wanted to be able to, to put into the world, but it was moving so slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what, catalyzed me to move into launching my own business because, um, you know, I figured what, well, and I knew because I'd been working with some of my um, entrepreneurial friends sort of uh, on an ad hoc capacity for a while. Um, and I knew that if I had, you know, a, a solopreneur, a, a single owner business sort of situation, and I'm talking to the, the decision maker, the person who holds all the cards, mm -hmm. Right. I could say, hey, what if we did this? And they would either be like, nah, and we could move on or they'd be like, oh, it's a good idea. And they'd go and do it. Yeah. And so yeah. that's that was a, a big shift uh, yeah. and, and a good change. <laughs> so is that is that your your main? Well, I guess let's 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 talk a little bit about what you do at the you know, at your uh, uh, self-employment coaching you know, position. Like what, what types of people do you uh, attract and work with and what are the types of, you know, uh, problems that you help them solve or, or help coach them through? Yeah. Yeah. So I work with, uh, primarily like I work with a lot of creative folks. People are pretty passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, but who have none of like the business skills, like they've not done any of that part of that. And so they're in a position where they want to, um, work for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, 
but they, they want a little help, a little guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love working with people when they have the idea and maybe they still have a day job and we navigate the, the transition and the, the first forming of the business, landing that first client, and then mm -hmm. the first two clients, five clients, 10 clients, right? Um, and building it into something that can actually uh, sustain, like give them a, a living income. Um, yeah, yeah. All from yeah. their own power. No, that's cool. So, uh, so now are you, I, obviously I would assume you're probably helping them with like, you know, forming the LLCs and getting EINs and all of that stuff, all the, you know, the business setup side of things. Oh, yeah. um, then, then do you, do you also help them, you know, on like, I guess the marketing side of things and, and more of the strategy or strategic side of things, you know, creating your customer avatars and all that kind of stuff. Is that, is that like kind of all fall underneath the umbrella? Yeah, exactly. I think of myself a little bit as a jack of all trades. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant, I don't give legal or accounting advice, but I can sort of point them in the right direction. Like, yeah, you need a business license. Here's who gives mm -hmm. you business licenses, stuff like that. And yeah, you should probably have an LLC and here's why. Um, and so, so yeah, part of what I'm able to offer is sort of the big picture of like, I've been in business doing this work for, for seven years now. And, you know, I can tell, like, I can see the spots that you're missing. Like sometimes mm -hmm, folks, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're missing why a customer avatar would be valuable um, yeah. or they just have never marketed themselves. So, and, and we all, I think we all have in this day and age um, examples of bad marketing and like mm -hmm. bad salesmanship, mm -hmm. but we don't have good examples of like how to do that stuff well or ethically or with integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I help my clients learn to do those things um in a way that that feels most comfortable for them yeah yeah that makes sense and and so you said that you work with a lot of creatives are we talking about um you know people that are you know more artistic type type people where you know maybe they're graphic designers or you know people like that or is it um you know i, I guess what, what types of what types of people fall underneath the creative umbrella if you will yeah, that's a great question because it's definitely, I take it as like a very big umbrella Yeah. Um, because, you know, I've got, um, uh, uh, yeah, graphic designers, of course, uh, but also like um, therapists and yoga teachers and um, mm -hmm. uh, equity consultants and um, what else comes to mind? Uh, yeah, real estate agents. Uh, clothing brands like i've i've got like it just all runs the, the place, gamut yeah. yeah but like the unifying feature of all of them is that they are they are relatively creative and passion driven themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense and, and what are some of the common problems that you see that a lot of those people um you know sort of running into time and time again what are some of the common things that maybe they might miss overlook might be doing wrong what are anything come to mind um yeah. So things that come to mind, I mean, a lot of it is uh, like personal management, I guess would mm -hmm, be the word mm -hmm. for it, where it's, you know, how do I stay on task? How do I, you know, I'm, I'm alone here with my own demons. Um, and so like, how do I navigate this? I don't have a boss. I don't have any external pressure or accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do I I manage my own time and, and agenda uh, in a way that's going to be successful. And that seems to be a, a pretty universal challenge for yeah. folks. Well, that's, that's the creative side, right? They're always all over the place. So I, I, <laughs> I, I kind of consider myself in that, that same camp too. So, you know, it is, you have to, you have to actually concentrate on focusing yourself and not jumping from one thing to the next. And, you know, there's another shiny thing over there. I got to go and tackle that now. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. What's uh so, and, and, have you, are you like doing this just in a local area or is this pretty well all over the country that you're, that you're helping people? Yeah, it's pretty all over the country, especially since um, the pandemic hit and, and yeah. we all went on Zoom. So um, I definitely have a strong foothold in the Pacific Northwest, but mm -hmm. I've got clients, um, you know, on the East Coast, uh, the center of the country. Um, I've worked with folks in uh, Minnesota, Kansas, Texas, like, Mm -hmm. um, all over the place, huh? All over the place. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and what, what would be some of the techniques that you help use with the people to keep them focused, to keep them on track, make sure that they're getting the things done? You know, is it, is it simply creating checklists? Is it, you know, blocking their time? You know, what, what, what are some of the techniques that you're using? Yeah, I think all of those techniques can be helpful. I think it's about um, tailoring it to what's going to work best for the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the other part of it that I offer is because of the structure of the way that I coach, I meet with people like every week. And so I keep like I keep in my notes what we're mm-hmm. working on. And so I come back to it and I want to check in and see how it's going. And so that offers some of that almost boss-like accountability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the other piece of it is, is helping people develop the habit, right? So if you get into a habit and you're working with me and it's like, oh, okay, wait, hold on. I have the system in place now and I know I can rely on this and I know how this works. I know that, you know, I've got whatever it is, like alarms set on my phone or my calendar or whatever, that's like, oh, you got to pay your taxes, right? That, that that's going to remind me. And so, um, like I'm, I'm a big fan of working myself out of a job. So I'm yeah. all about like, let's get this as sustainable as possible. But in yeah. the interim, I'm here to offer some of that accountability. And, and so, so I guess sort of that, that, that mindset of, um, you know, automating as much as you can and, and, you know, delegating as much as you can, um, you know, you're, you're working with, it sounds like many, you know, solopreneurs, or maybe there's, you know, just one or two people. And I know that that's something that a lot of people sort of get stuck with where, um, you know, they feel like either they have to do it all themselves. You know, they've got the, I, I heard somebody call this the, the I'm a mentality, right? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do everything right. You know, so I, I think that's a great way to be able to, you know, uh, refer to what a lot of people sort of struggle with, but how do you, how do you get them past that? How do the, how do you get them to realize that, Hey, you know what, you know, I know I might not necessarily have the money to, to hire this out or have somebody else do this, but this is taking me so much longer that I could be doing other things that I'm better at to, to uh, you know, that I could be generating more money to be able to help pay for this other thing, whatever it is. Like, how, how do you walk them through that, that whole scenario? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, what's more common with my clients is they're like, please don't make me do this anymore. How do we make me not do this? Like okay. they're not, okay. I don't work with a ton of control freaks. There are that's some, good. There are that's good. Um, but you know, and I would put myself in the control freak camp, camp frankly. Um, but yeah, so usually it's more of like, how do I afford this? And the, the thing that I work with there is that that's, that's a, uh, cash flow and cash allocation problem, mm-hmm. right? Like if we have priced your service appropriately, you should have some substantial money, you know, at least 20, 30% of your revenue can go to overhead, Yeah. which if you're making your living off of it, that means you can hire a virtual assistant. That means you can hire a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, if your volume is high enough and we've priced you appropriately, then you have the money to do it. You just need to rip that bandaid off and do it. Now, the problem comes in when folks have not priced themselves appropriately or they are, you know, not quite at the volume yet. And so we have to, um, you know, do the thing we don't like doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> until they <laughs> somebody, yeah. And, and how, how do you go about helping them identify what they should be, they should be charging? And I, I think that this is another thing that a lot of creatives um, sort of struggle with where they think like, I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of people just basically price themselves, whatever the market is. And then, you know, you're, you're struggling just like the rest of the market, right? You know, if you charge a premium, you know, establish yourself, yourself as a premium, then, you know, that helps. So uh, do you have any insights or, or, uh, you know, ideas on how you help coach people to establish what they should be worth and what they should be charging and then actually implement that, that, that price? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. A moment is a whole different question, but when it comes to figuring out the price, um, like there's definitely a piece of like understanding what the the market landscape is, you know, Mm -hmm. what are other people charging? What is the sort of value price? And then what is sort of more the, um, high quality price? Cause we Mm -hmm. probably want to aim for that. Um, but I also, so I usually use sort of two principles when figuring out, um, the, like the floor as it were. So, If you're doing your job as an employee and you're getting paid an hourly rate, Mm -hmm. you take that hourly rate and you multiply it by three to get Mm -hmm. your consultant rate. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and there's plenty of industries I work in that there's not like an equivalency here. Um, but it does sort of, you know, if you're like, well, I think I should be earning $25 an hour. You don't price yourself at $25 right. an hour, right? Right. You're pricing yourself at least 75. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and people sometimes sort of balk at that principle, but it offers the coverage of the overhead and all the marketing you've got to do. And like yeah. all of the clients you meet with who don't become clients. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's really important to have that margin in place. And that usually gets us into the ballpark where it's like, I get people out of the 25 an hour and I'm more like, okay, we're closer to hundred. We're, yeah. we're in the right camp. Um, and then the other piece of this is when you're positioning yourself in the market, um, you can, there, there's really only three ways you can optimize your business. You can optimize based on, um, price, uh, based on quality or based on convenience. Mm -hmm. So when you're a solo entrepreneur, you don't want to be the cheapest. You're not working at volume. You can't, that's not going to work. Um, you don't want to be the most convenient because that means you're going to be on call all the time. And I Mm -hmm. don't think you actually want that. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at quality and you don't need to be the most deluxe luxury, but like, we're going to celebrate your quality and we're going to price you at a quality price. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I use the example of the butter section at the grocery store because I buy the cheap butter that's like two forty nine dollars a pound. And then they have this other butter that's like six bucks a pound, mm-hmm. right? That's like your European hand churned uh, from cows that have been hugged every day. I don't know what makes <laughs> it special, but like they are able to price essentially the same product at like double. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at. We're not looking to be the cheapest. Mm -hmm. Um, We're looking to establish our quality. And a lot of times your price is the initial like stab at like how high quality you are. Yeah. 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 No, that makes perfect sense. And, and how you mentioned that people sort of balk at, you know, the three times, whatever I feel like I should be, you know, getting charged or, or I should be charging, Um, you know, so that that's obviously a very, you know, employee type, mindset, right? You know, where, well, I was making, you know, $20 an hour before. So if I could just make an extra $5, that would be, you know, incredible. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what they base it on, you know? Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you go about getting them past that mindset where, where they like, they're obviously going to feel very uncomfortable, right? Like, Oh, nobody's going to pay $75 for you know my service per hour or whatever it is. Nobody's ever going to pay that, you know, I'm going to go out of business. Like how, how do you, do you like slowly introduce it or is it like, okay, well, you know, you can charge you know, small, you know, charge your $25 here, but just, you know, every, every now and then throw 75 in there. Like, how do you, how do you introduce that? Or is it again, rip off the bandaid and just do it? Like, how do you, how do you convince them? Um, usually ripping off the bandaid works pretty well on the convincing front. Mm-hmm. If they've already been selling their services at like, you know, 25 bucks an hour, then we are going to have a problem because all your clients are going to have sticker shock. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, there's different strategies for how to implement it. Um, you know, I think grandfathering in current, current clients and then sort of shifting the price for newer clients. Um, I think there's also a piece of it where, um, if your price is always a little bit uncomfortable to you, like Mm -hmm. it's, it's at your sort of leading edge then you are challenging yourself appropriately. So yeah. it should never feel wildly comfortable to state your rate. If it does, it's a good time to think about increasing your rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, what, so, so that would work, I guess, for um, you know, people that have, you know, they're offering a service, right? Um, how, do you, how do you look at people that might be offering some type of a product and, and pricing that product out, you know, even if that's, you know, just reselling things or whatever it might be, but how do you, how do you approach that? Is it similar or what's, what's the, what's the idea there? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty similar. You know, again, you don't want to be the discount option. China's mm-hmm. got you beat every time. So yeah. what are you doing that's unique and why is it valuable? And then price it appropriately, like make it a premium because like you have been the person who have sourced the quality product or you've Mm -hmm. created it with your own hands or whatever it is, right? Um, We need to be uh, celebrating that aspect of it um, Mm -hmm. and pricing it in that marketplace um, that the person wants to buy this thing because they really like, because you have offered it to them and they really want it. Um, Not because it's like, oh, well, that's the cheapest widget like that, that I can find. I'll just buy that one. Yeah. 
Yeah. That isn't going to work for most solopreneurs. Yeah. And then, and then uh, this is another thing that I know a lot of people struggle with is, um, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to mark things up, you know, two times, three times, um, or what, what, so what's better marking things up or are charging by margin, uh, and, and factoring your price in by margin. If, if you have a physical product, is that, have you ever run across mm-hmm. that one? Yeah. So you're, you're hitting like the edge of what I, what I do. I, I tend to not do a ton of product-based stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, so usually what I run into with folks is that they're, they don't have, either they haven't marked up two, three times. They haven't put any kind of margin in. Um, they haven't, a lot of times people have figured out like what the cost of the product is mm-hmm. like at mm-hmm. cost, it's this much. And I actually find a lot of folks who are really great about like counting their time into that and things yeah. like that. Um, but then, you know, realizing that a lot of times the retail margin is two to three times, like it is significantly more than the at cost price, especially if you're planning to wholesale, right? Because that's yeah. going to eat into that. Yep. Um, so just really making that nice and big and healthy um, tends to help a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it gets sense. you into that echelon of like, you know, quality goods rather than discount. Yep. Yep. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, I guess the, the marketing aspect or how you help people get, uh, get clients. Is it, you know, are you helping them build websites and all of that? Or is there, you know, are there other, you know, processes that you would take them through or refer them to other people? Yeah. So, I mean, this day and age, you've got to have a website. So that's usually a piece of what we're doing. Um, I help, like, I, I think that there's a lot of tools out there and a lot of professionals to help. So oftentimes if it's the person's preference, I'll refer them out. Um, but I think there is a piece where learning to write your, or learning, learning your marketing message, Mm -hmm. which I use the website as like the, the framework for like what, what that would look like. Yeah. Um, and so coming up with that yourself is usually pretty important for my clients, because if you have never done any kind of sales or marketing, you probably want some time to sort of think through it and figure out sort of like, what are the talking points? So even if you're not really going to be selling from a website and you're going to be doing like face-to-face networking or something, um, you still want to be able to have thought through it and thought about the positioning of it. So yeah, I usually work through, um, you know, writing website content with my clients, not so much because, you know, I want them to have a website. I do. But like, I think the thought process is more valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and once you've got that sort of foundational piece of a website or whatever that looks like, then we go on to uh, marketing projects. And I usually, because solo entrepreneurs have really limited time mm-hmm. um, and because I work with creatives who always have like a billion and five ideas, like, oh, yeah. I should have an Instagram channel and a YouTube and a this and a that. And I'm like, okay, hold on, whoop, 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 let's rein this in, right? So I look at it as a team of horses. You've got a plow horse and you've got a race horse mm-hmm. and you get to have one project in each on each horse at a time. And that's it because mm-hmm. you, you then also have all of your clients and all the other stuff you have to do around your business. You don't got time for more than that. Yeah. Your plow horse is going to be really consistent. It's going to be some, usually it's some sort of content generation scheme. Mm-hmm. Uh, so blogging, podcasting, um, sometimes people, social media, um, will, will be that thing like YouTube. Um, but it's some sort of like producing content out there that happens at a steady but sustainable rate. So mm-hmm. monthly, twice monthly, maybe quarterly, depending on, on the client. Um, and that's going to be in it for the long haul. So you don't change your race horse or your plow horse very often, right? Because it's usually an investment. Uh, you know, like blogging is fantastic, but you know, it's in long three view. months, you're not going to see a ton yeah. of new clients from it. In three years, you will. Yeah. Um, so, so that's your plot horse. And then you got your racehorse, which is, uh, you know, whatever project of the moment that's, that's more of a sprint that you're going to probably change every quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like for this quarter, this is the effort that I'm making and then I'm going to let it go. Mm-hmm. Um, and the racehorse is where a lot of the variety comes in. And that's where, you know, if you're having great ideas about like, oh, I should, join a BNI group or I should, you know, join the chamber of commerce or like, I want to go meet every real estate agent in town, right? Like that's a great plow horse, I mean, race horse activity, because you're going to do that uh, for a minute and then you're going to stop 
yeah. and do something else. Yeah. 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 No, that makes perfect sense. And, and when you, when you're looking at it with that perspective, you know, the plow horse and the racehorse, and like you said, you, you put parameters around it where I'm going to do that for this quarter. Um, and I'm assuming that like some of these types of things, like you said, I mean, you mentioned BNI, um, you mentioned like in the beginning, you mentioned that, you know, I need social media, I need Instagram, I need Facebook, whatever it is. It, it, how would you know, like, how would you know that it's time to you know, put the Instagram channel down? Like if that was one of your racehorses, how do you, how do you know that? Okay, let's, let's switch to Facebook now and we'll, we'll leave, we'll leave Instagram away. Or do I keep going for another quarter of Instagram? Like, is there, is there any kind of method that you would advise to know what direction should be the next path that you would take or continue on the same path maybe for another quarter? Yeah. I mean, I think it's an overlap of like where your own personal energies are with where you're seeing results. And that's Mm -hmm. part of why I sort of time box it as like a quarter. Um, Like it could be a month or something like that, but um, you know, you kind of want to put something out there and it might need to take time to germinate. Like, like you're planting a seed, right? Like I just planted tulips. I'm not going to see them come up until the spring. Yeah. Um, And that's how a lot of marketing efforts work. So even with these racehorse activities, you know, we might need to move on from it to see if it actually generated a result. Yeah. Um, and if we feel like it was wildly unsuccessful, great, let's move on from it. Like even more reason to shift gears and say, you know, I, I put in a solid three months of this project. Um, let's move on to something else. If in hindsight, right, like a year down the line, we're like, that was actually really effective. It just took yeah. like six months for them all to come up great. Then we can do that again. Like you can yeah. always pick up the project again. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And, and are you, do you have any, um, I guess I, maybe everyone is a little bit different. Like what, is there any kind of a ranking? Like, you know, we've seen like these types of things work best. Like, is it, is it social that seems to be working best for people or is it blogging or is it, you know, joining the local, you know, chamber of commerce or BNI or whatever it might be more local physical types of things. I guess maybe that might be, you know, very, very specific to each business, but I guess, is there, is there anyone that, you know, people seem to be doing and having more success with today than others? Yeah, this is actually a great question. I love this question because uh, I think people get really interested in the shininess of social yeah. media and the amount that that's talked about. And if we're talking about like true racehorse, I got to get out there and hustle and get a client. Um, that's going to happen from in-person connections mm-hmm. and not even like BNI Chamber of Commerce in person, but like, who do you already know? Who yeah. is in your circle or one degree removed from your circle? And so I always have everybody do like when they first start working with me and after we've got that website up, like go tell everybody, like yeah. go tell your aunt Susie, go tell everybody, Sally, you went to kindergarten with, I don't care. They need to know that you have a website and the more that you can, like, like you've got to activate that network so that, cause those people are going to be the best, um, mm-hmm. Cheerleaders for you. Yeah, yeah. Like they, you need them to support you. You also need them out there listening and being like, oh, you need to work with so and so because that's exactly what they do. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so you've got to talk to people. And then once you hit like sort of the edge of your bubble, right? It's about how do we leverage one more degree of separation out? How do we expand our network into sort of desirable areas? So, how do I meet with um, the people who are sort of in this world already and leverage them into giving me one more connection. Yeah. And I think it's very much uh, a person to person, like FaceTime sort of thing, like not mm-hmm. the, not the Apple app, but like actually meeting yeah. with people. And it doesn't have to be in physical space. It can be over Zoom. This past year has taught us we can do a lot over Zoom, yeah. um, but actually getting some FaceTime and having a conversation with someone and starting to build that relationship. Mm-hmm. relationships are where good business comes from. So yeah, that's where you've and, got to start. And do you find that a lot of these people, I mean, creatives tend to be a little bit more outgoing, but do you, do you have a lot of people that may have a lot of anxiety about getting in front of other people or, or, you know, standing in front and pitching whatever it is that they're, you know, starting or launching? Is that, is that a common thing that you kind of have to over, overcome as well? 
Oh yeah, I live in the Pacific Northwest. This is the haven of the introvert, and I'm yeah. like one of the rare <laughs> extroverts out here. So yeah, no, I love working with folks who who are more introverted. And they're like, please don't make me go to a BNI group. Yeah, and I'm like, cool, don't. All right, don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but there's usually a way. Like there's some scale of human interaction that is sustainable even for introverts. So mm -hmm. if it's somebody that you are you're already familiar with that's usually a lot more comfortable if you have that introduction, right? So mm -hmm. if you meet with your friend and they connect you to somebody else, sometimes that's a lot more comfortable. Um, pacing oneself, right? Like you don't need to have coffee with somebody every single day. You'll yeah. go insane. You'll forget who you met, right? Yeah. So pace yourself out with it. Um, yeah, and then just thinking about the, the um, yeah, different sort of formats. Like I don't think you have to stand in front of a room. Um, I don't, the, like the, the flip side of, of being an extrovert is sometimes we don't go deep enough. We don't actually build a relationship. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're sort of social butterfly and it's all surface and we never actually build that connection that matters. So yeah. I think there's, there's a, a balance point in between that, like that everybody can sort of find for themselves. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. And, and I guess this kind of plays into, um, establishing that connection, right? Because, you know, there's only so deep that you're going to go, you know, with having coffee with someone, right? You're, you're only going to get that connection so much. So um, any advice on uh, tools, systems, processes, whatever it is, uh, to, to be able to keep in touch with people and making sure that you remember, like you, you mentioned, like you'll forget who you met, right? Um, you know, how, how, how have you found uh, a good way to be able to keep in touch with people and make sure that, you know, you are following up, you are keeping in front of them, you know, you are continuing that relationship and keeping, you know, keep building that relationship. Any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, take notes, uh, like not maybe in the meeting, but like in my contact list, in my, in my Google contacts, I have notes on everybody where I'm like, this is the person who was like this. And the, like, I jot down who their ideal client is because I always ask them that. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I want to send you people you actually like. So I'm going to make some notes about who, what type of person I think they would work well with so that I can refer to them. Um, and then when it comes to like looping back around, some of that is, you know, you might be, um, at like picking out a new racehorse activity and being like, I haven't talked to like the, all those people I sourced back in the, I should reach out to some of them. And the ones who yeah. I, you know, I enjoyed having coffee with, go have another coffee. Sometimes it's, um, you know, sort of automated reminders, like you last met with this person six months ago, go, go poke at them or, yeah. you know, yeah. find an article they might find interesting and send it to them in an email. Yeah. Like yeah. whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. Now this is, this is all really interesting stuff. This is all, all good stuff. Um, you know, all the foundational things that you need to, to, to get things started. Um, if, if people wanted to learn more about you, your services, what would you say is the best way to, to reach out and uh, get in touch? Yeah. Uh, probably the easiest thing is just to find me at my website, maggiekarshner.com, but I'm also on pretty much all social media. Okay. Not TikTok. I haven't done TikTok yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, maggiekarshner.com or on your favorite social media. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, and I, I, I actually, one of my, uh, one of my assistants actually just ran one of our podcasts, uh, a clip from one of our podcasts on TikTok this morning, actually. And they said that they got like 200 views in like, like a few minutes. So <laughs> we might, uh, you might be on TikTok and you may not even know it. <laughs> so <laughs> I might have to face face the land of TikTok. Yep. It might be my I, don't, I don't have one either. I don't have it either. But, uh, you know, after, after she said that, I was like, okay, let's go ahead and go get, get one set up. And, you know, so, uh, yeah. you know, we'll, uh, we'll compare notes there, but, uh, Maggie, this has been a complete pleasure. And, uh, I love that you're, you're helping bring more entrepreneurs in or more entrepreneurs into the world and, and helping them, you know, make their dreams happen. So that's yeah, uh, thanks fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. No problem.